The title of today's talk is What is the Soft Drug Problem? Gatekeeping, Pharmacist Authority, and the Pharmaceutical Industry, 1925 to 1975. I'm Dr. Lucas Rickard, based in the School of Pharmacy, and I'm also joined by Gabriel Lake Carter uh, from the English Department here on the UW campus. If you're interested in the history of pharmacy generally, um, please think about uh, being involved with the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy. You can follow the AIHP on Twitter. You can follow History of Pharmacy on Instagram. You can also think about becoming a member and getting involved on a personal level. We also have a YouTube channel where you can watch lectures from the past. And before we get started today, I, I just wanted to say about the title, Gatekeeping Pharmacist Authority. In particular, this is not a new issue by any stretch of the imagination. The pharmacy profession, professional identity, uh, and the different scope of responsibilities that pharmacists have had have been debated heavily uh, really since the uh, 1900s up to the present moment. Uh, and what uh, Gabriel A. Carter and I are going to do is provide some context around this type of uh, these discussions uh, and delve into the soft drug problem uh, and other topics. So just to give you a, a sense of, of conflicts, I, we have no conflicts to declare, but we absolutely must acknowledge um, the funding that comes from the UW-Madison Fall uh, Research Competition that supported this work. And we also have to acknowledge the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, for providing resources um, to help with discovery uh, of various sources that are used uh, in this talk. So let's turn to uh, the paper and the overall uh, project background. What I'm going to do uh, in my section of the paper, which is gonna be uh, 10, 12 minutes, uh, perhaps a little longer, is give you a sense of the scope of our project, uh, and then maybe do a little bit of a show and tell with you. Uh, and then we're gonna zoom in, as this image suggests, uh, and uh, Gabriel is gonna talk a little bit about the soft drug problem. So that just tells you a little bit about our format. So this paper uh, and this talk uh, has uh, grown out of a larger project, which is called Drugstore Inc, The Rise of Big Pharmacy and American Health Capitalism. This is the project that's been funded by the UW-Madison Fall Research Competition. And the idea behind this project is to uh, develop a new history, a new book to deal with uh, and to understand uh, the history of pharmacy in the United States. So this project uh, is interrogating uh, the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals uh, together. And the time period involved uh, is really from the end of the Great Depression in the United States up to the 1970s, 1980s. It was never uh, preordained that Americans would witness continued strength in the pharmacy sector or the rise of powerful chain pharmacies um, uh, during uh, and after World War II up to the present moment. It wasn't just a given that the American pharmaceutical industry would march forward to such a position of strength globally by the 1990s and the 2000s. So the project is really uh, around trying to understand how we've gotten to this point. Uh, and so the project is asking several questions around the nature of the growth and what does this growth over time, of both the pharmacy sector and the pharmaceutical industry suggest about American health around technology and health capitalism. And so the project uh, that was funded has four main areas. Number one, to stimulate research into the underexplored history of American drugstores and pharmacies in the post-war period. There are very few monographs uh, that we can draw on, very few um, 
solid pieces of scholarship um, that help answer big questions. Secondly, we want to examine how pharmacy spaces particularly were constructed, organized, and designed to best treat patient consumers, as well as generate profits in the United States after World War II. Thirdly, we want to critically analyze categories of products that were sold within pharmacy spaces after World War II. And lastly, we want to examine the evolving professional authority and responsibilities of the pharmacist within the healthcare and business landscape. So these are the four areas uh, that have driven the much larger project. And what you can do is break this down into several buckets. And so there are four main areas uh, that are gonna be explored in this larger project. And then uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, two of these buckets. Um, uh, so I'll speak a little bit about uh, design and then Gabe is gonna speak about uh, psychoactive products. So we have these ways of trying to understand the evolution and change of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals since 1945 up to the present moment. It's gonna be uh, incredibly valuable to think through ethnicity and gender. Again, there aren't rigorous historical analyses of um, how education, franchisees, associational leadership positions um, um, in have intersected with women and persons of color. So we just don't know enough as historians and scholars around the role of women and persons of color um, within the pharmacy space. We don't know enough as well about architecture and design. Uh, so this has to do with how outside forces uh, consulting companies, pharmaceutical companies helped to influence the ways in which pharmacy spaces um, were built, the built environment. So uh, we're looking at schematics, we're looking at flooring plans, we're trying to understand uh, facades, external facades, uh, flooring plans. Um, so we're looking uh, at the ways in which uh, the, the built environment was shaped ultimately by uh, by multiple parties. We're looking at psychoactive products that includes tobacco, alcohol, sugar, and certain pharmaceutical products. How these products were deeply, deeply integrated within pharmacy spaces and what this ultimately meant for professional identity, professional authority, and some of the debates involved amongst different pharmacists uh, and other healthcare professionals. And then lastly, we want to think about technology, advertising and marketing, computerization, some of the dr uh, drug breakthroughs uh, and, and you know, things like cash machines that we don't often think about as being very important in the history of pharmacy. So this is again, uh, just a way of providing a big picture overview of this larger project, uh, the ways in which um, we're going about our business uh, and some of the questions that emerge, one of which is uh, the soft drug problem that uh, Gabe will speak about um, in a few minutes. But before I turn it over uh, to Gabe uh, to share some amazing uh, visuals and sources from uh, the collections uh, here at uh, UW-Madison and uh, the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy, I also wanted to do the same uh, and in a sort of show and tell kind of way to set the stage. Uh, I wanted to focus just very quickly um, on architecture and, and design because I think that this is particularly fascinating. But before that, um, I just wanted to underline for you that when you're doing this type of historical work to understand uh, the changing nature of uh, the pharmacy profession, uh, the business of pharmacy. There are all sorts of literatures to explore. And if you're interested, um, I think that it is valuable uh, to maybe just highlight some of what uh, is available uh, here in the School of Pharmacy um, and at the IHP. We have an oral history collection that's available on YouTube 
This is a series of interviews with community pharmacists and, and helps really narrate some of the, the uh, strange, interesting, informative debates um, in pharmacy and pharmacy practice. Uh, we also have a, a different oral collection uh, that uh, was given to us by uh, David Baker. We have uh, ink blotters that help tell the story uh, of uh, how you know pharmacy was done. We've got the Mickey Smith drug advertising collection, and that's on the uh, AIHP uh, uh, webpage um, Omeka site, which is available for you to scan um, at your leisure. So just to, just to let you know then that there are all sorts of different sources that you have access to. And, and maybe um, uh, if you're interested, we can uh, talk more about this in, in the Q&A. So design, I wanna just linger on design for a second because I, I think that this is um, gonna maybe set the stage a little bit for Gabe's section of the paper and maybe he can talk a little bit about uh, design as well when he, he um, uh, illuminates the soft drug problem. Design is um, an area of the history of uh, pharmacy that has not received nearly uh, enough attention as it ought to have. Now, um, the, the key questions involved here have to do with the ways in which pharmacy owners or pharmacy managers or uh, individuals within uh, larger chain store companies decided to organize their, sh uh, their shops, their stores, whether or not it's uh, a chemist shop, apothecary, or um, a super drug store, if you will. So who was it that was helping shape the way uh, the, a store was designed, how the products were organized, where the prescription department was? And the answer is that um, the influencers were often um, from the drug industry, from consulting companies. And this one uh, document portfolio uh, of designs comes from Park Davis and Company. You had consulting companies such as McKesson and Robbins uh, who helped um, get you thinking as someone in the pharmacy space, as a retailer, uh, about whether or not your layout was working for you or was it working against you. Often one of the core messages in uh, the design uh, of a store was whether or not you were modern. This is really an integral sort of uh, piece uh, of, the, of the campaign. Whether or not you as a store owner, whether or not you as an employee in a pharmacy had a modern uh, design, because that was gonna be ultimately extremely attractive uh, to customers uh, and to others. I just love showing some of these documents quite honestly, uh, it, because it helps pull back the curtain uh, in certain ways, it sort of gets you thinking around, you know, why a store is organized uh, the way it is. You had uh, McKesson Robbins again, telling you um, with certain materials that drugstore selling could be made easy. Uh, and there were a variety of techniques and slogans that um, they would suggest were important uh, to initiate within your store. Uh, Johnson and Johnson, uh, had a, a, a design uh, department um, that was um, really crafted uh, with certain messages in mind. Uh, again, modernization, as you can see, um, is highlighted, as was um, the best way to merchandise, the best way to leverage your personnel. Here they're using the word manpower. And, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson, as it suggests, wanted to promote a dynamic druggist, and this would ultimately lead to a dramatic success story for individuals in the pharmacy space. So these were uh, really crucial documents um, that helped get store owners think through what was the proper prescription department location, what were factors that influenced uh, a department's atmosphere, 
This might be the prescription department. This might be sundries department. This might be the alcohol department. This might be the tobacco department. One thing that was um, often underlined was that you had to include drama, that uh, drama was very important. This could be uh, by elevating the prescription department. This could be by uh, using neon lights uh, or bold signage. Uh, decor is also another feature that helped highlight certain areas of the store. You know, why not have carpeting? Why not use uh, luxury and sophisticated um, uh, furniture? So this all led to uh, a well-designed store according to these materials. And uh, you had to ask yourself certain questions if you were a pharmacist. Are you drawing customers deep into your store? Are you making the most of your valuable uh, perimeter of your store? Have you created a selling console at, at the wrapping counter? That's, that's always fascinating to me, the, the wrapping area. And this is something that is crucial. Were all areas of the store activated? And this, uh, you know, if, if the answer was uh, yes to these, then, you know, your store layout was working for you. Now, the reason I'm showing you some of these uh, amazing uh, cutouts and uh, documents, uh, again, are available at the AIHP, at the UWSOP, is to sort of clarify that um, there has been a longstanding debate uh, within the pharmacy profession uh, around whether or not the pharmacist was a tradesperson and a retailer or a healthcare professional, someone who was deeply involved in the patient out, uh, patient's outcomes, someone who was very involved in providing the appropriate uh, health care for that um, particular individual. This debate, this debate around retail, retailer versus healthcare professional is something uh, that really generated a lot of uh, heat and light in the 1960s and the 1970s, which carried forward into the 1980s and the, and the present moment. And this debate has really a, a lot to do uh, with uh, pharmacist authority and professional identity. And I think that's probably uh, you know, a useful sort of background, uh, a little bit of primer uh, to sort of set you up for uh, Gabe's section of the paper and um, happily turn it over uh, to you. Thanks, Dr. Ricker. So as mentioned, I am Gabriel Carter. I've been helping work on this project for quite some time now. And that metaphor that Luke just gave around design, specifically around the tradesmen working in this commercialized jungle, versus the professional who's working as the conscientious guardian of health does really relate to the authority of pharmacists in the medical marketplace, the credibility and the overall ethos of pharmacists in that space. Now, the reason why I want to point back to that and then move on to this part of the soft drug topic problem is because what you notice in these materials and what I'm going to hopefully unpack through the remainder of this presentation is thinking about how drug regulation affects this dividing line between drugs and medicines, between soft drugs and hard drugs, and how that affects the overall credibility and authority of pharmacists in the process. So the first three materials that we're gonna look at, starting with this cartoon that we have on screen, all come from the middle of the 20th century kind of bookending that time period that we had set up at the beginning, 1925 to 1975. This political cartoon here comes from 1925. The short release from the American Pharmaceutical Association that I'll show next is from 1962. And the pamphlet on soft drugs comes from 1974. And then eventually I'll move on to some Frank Pinchek posters around the middle of the 20th century as well. 
The reason why I want to touch on that time period is because there is a much more vast history that we could get into, but we only have a limited amount of time. And so I wanted to pick out materials that highlight ongoing debates from the early part of the 20th century to the middle and then moving into the 21st century to give you an idea of how these conversations were shifting around pharmacist authority, drug regulation, and the drug medicine divide. So let's start here. This is a March 1925 edition of the Bulletin of Pharmacy. Inside of it, on page 92, what you'll see is this political cartoon. Down in the right-hand corner, you can see that F. Lyons, or Flyons, but I think it's F. Lyons, is the cartoonist and author of this piece. What it's depicting is a political satire of what's going on to both pharmacists and people who use drugs in relation to the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act of 1914. Now, just as a little history, one of the major implications of the Harrison Act, as well as the subsequent court rulings that came out in the years thereafter, was that pharmacists could no longer prescribe drugs like opioids to people who are struggling with addiction. So previously, pharmacists and physicians had the ability to help people who use drugs taper from those drugs by actually providing them to people who are struggling with addiction. But in the Harrison Act and the subsequent court rulings, this was no longer allowed. It's important for you to know that because this specific piece is talking about the implications of what happens on both sides of that coin, for pharmacists on the one hand, as well as for people who use drugs. So as you can see here, the cartoon depicts two men chained by their necks to a wall. On the right side of the image, there's a pharmacist sitting at a desk doing paperwork. And if you can't see it, the label that's there that he's writing on says Federal Report Narcotic Sales. And above his head is a thought bubble that has a bottle on it that says dope, and right next to it, a scale, which implies that pharmacists have the training and the ability to accurately dose the necessary amount of drugs for their patient. On the left side of the image, on the other hand, there's a man standing with a dripping syringe and a thought bubble above his head with bags of money in it, implying that now that he can't get the drugs that he needs from his pharmacist, he now has to search out money to keep his drug habit going in one way or another. And on the wall behind them, there is that sign that says, violently insane only, and they're both chained by their neck to that wall, which really just implies that the Harrison Law is making them both go insane in one way or another. For the pharmacist, through all the paperwork and the inability to prescribe, and for the person who uses drugs, the fact that they have to go in search of money to keep this habit going over and over again. Now, the tagline at the bottom down there says, quote, one went batty from dope, the other from trying to live up to Harrison Law regulations, a joke or a tragedy. And that's the big point that this piece is trying to make. Is this a joke or is this tragedy? The drug regulation that was put through was trying to both help pharmacists protect people who use drugs and protect public health in some way. But these implications of it are that it was actually damaging or harmful on either side of that coin. So of course, the cartoon is suggesting that the Harrison Law metaphorically chained both pharmacists and people who use drugs to a wall because it forced pharmacists to spend their time doing paperwork and forced people who use drugs away from a safe supply of drugs and into an illicit market that required large amount of money to sustain. In the themes of this presentation, however, what's really important to notice is that when federal drug legislation takes place, such as the Harrison Law, it affects pharmacists and people who use drugs alike, not one or the other. Drug regulation, that is to say, determines what counts as a drug and what counts as a medicine and who can use these in legitimate fashions. Put simply, it's very clear that pharmacy is entangled with drug regulation, both benefiting from the authority and credibility that it grants them as the sole purveyors of legitimate medicines, but it also chains them down to further regulation and oversight that can often harm people who use drugs. On this next slide here, 
I want to look at a material that Dr. Rickard actually found and shared with me. And it really threw the entanglement of pharmacy with drug regulation into clear relief for us. And it's this press release that came out from the American Pharmaceutical Association in 1962. The Remington Medal is an award that the American Pharmaceutical Association gives to people who have done the most for pharmacy in that year. If you actually go to their website, there's still a long list of all the recipients of this award throughout the past century. In this specific release, they are giving the award in 1962 to Harry J. Anslinger, the notorious drug seller. So for those of you who don't know, though I'm sure many of you are pretty well aware, Anslinger was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for over 30 years, from its inception till shortly after this press release, actually. He's most famous for writing pieces like Marijuana, Assassin of Youth, and helping fuel the reefer madness of that time. Um, He has been, since then, roundly critiqued on a number of these issues. Uh, A great book to check out, for instance, is Alexandra Chasson's Assassin of Youth, which is all about his work and the way that his views on class, race, and criminality played into the way that he approached drug policy and how he helped create a hysteria around cannabis in particular and fueled that reefer madness. Now, the reason that I bring up this history and how he's viewed nowadays in contemporary work is because the American Pharmaceutical Association had a much different view in 1962. As you can see in this poll quote on the left side, Anslinger was awarded this medal for, quote, his humanitarian, because he was humanitarian and an international servant of the people, for his outstanding contribution to public health and to the profession of pharmacy through the control and suppression of illicit traffic in and use of narcotic drugs, end quote. So instead of seeing Anslinger as a drug czar that put many people behind bars, he was seen as a humanitarian servant of the people who contributed to public health in the profession of pharmacy because of his ability to control illicit traffic and drugs. Um, So this press release goes on to note a number of things that he did, including reduction in addiction, anticipating a need for opium in medical situations, closing Far Eastern opium monopolies, limiting the manufacture of narcotic drugs to solely manufacturing for medical situations, and he tied up a bunch of ships engaged in smuggling. So put more directly and in line with what we're poking at in this presentation, Anslinger was awarded this medal because he enforced the drug medicine divide that made some drugs considered soft while others were considered hard drugs. We can move on to that in the next slide here. So about a decade later, 12 years to be exact, after that press release, in 1974, the Pharmacist Society of Milwaukee County published a pamphlet, as you can see here, that's titled, Soft Drugs, a Consumer Manual on Prescription and Non-Prescription Medications. And this further details that dividing line between soft drugs and hard drugs. So the pamphlet claims a number of things, which in a second I'm gonna delve into on the next slide but it really is pointing out how drugs have become a staple in what they call the American way of life. This includes psychoactive substances like those Dr. Rickert listed earlier, including alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, and sugar, which have been available in pharmacies for quite some time, as well as over-the-counter medications such as antacids, sleeping pills, mood enhancers, diet pills, et cetera. What's interesting before moving on is if you look at this back cover here on the right side, there are, looks like five people who are kneeling down as if in prayer or devotion to this pill bottle that is full of a variety of pills with this kind of mechanistic halo over it, making it look as if drugs have become a natural part of the American way of life. And what we need to talk about are what counts as a soft drug and a hard drug which I'll zoom in on the next slide here. So in that first paragraph that was there, one of the main points that they make are that three drugs have become part of the American way of life. Specifically, they pull out alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine as staples in the American way of life. 
Now, why I want to point this out right at the beginning is that these are neither considered soft drugs or hard drugs throughout this pamphlet. Instead, they are just considered psychoactive substances that are a part of life. They aren't regulated in the way that other hard drugs are, but they also aren't considered medicines. They fit into this picture in a very interesting way. There's a long history of that that we could get into maybe in the Q&A. And at the bottom of it, they point out that pills are increased, increasingly becoming a part of our daily life, whether that's antacids, mood pills, whatever it may be. But they say at the bottom of this first paragraph that now we're even having pills to help us break the habit of taking pills, which really implies that here in the U.S., taking drugs and medicines is a part of life, and you may never actually stop taking them. You may just take a new pill that alleviates your old pills. Now, the second part at the bottom here on that bottom right corner is a paragraph that gets at what is the difference between a hard drug and a soft drug. What they name a hard drug are drugs like heroin and LSD. Those are the two that they specifically pull out that have been criminalized by federal drug policy. Soft drugs, on the other hand, are, quote, the medicines prescribed by our doctors and the drug remedies we buy over the counter. So this delineation that they have falls right on that side of drug regulation. The ones that are criminalized are hard drugs. The ones that are not criminalized and are available by physicians and pharmacists are considered soft drugs. What's particularly interesting about this is that they point out heroin and LSD, which in the 1970s were a big topic of conversation. And they don't mention that heroin was actually used in medical settings for quite some time before it was criminalized. And the fact that LSD also had extensive research on it throughout the mid 20th century, although it was never necessarily used in medical settings as frequently as heroin was. So what really becomes clear from this soft drugs pamphlet is not just the condemnation of those hard drugs, though that's certainly one of the aims that they have, but it's also that patients and consumers of soft drugs need to be educated about what they're consuming and putting into their bodies. In fact, throughout this pamphlet, they keep harping on the fact that you need facts about drugs and able to make these decisions. So in this way, the document serves to both instantiate the line between soft drugs and hard drugs, but as well as trying to promote the credibility of pharmacists as those that can offer the facts about drugs in an effort to reduce the harms of them and increase the benefits of soft drugs. So put simply, at least within the context of the U.S., soft drugs are those in the hands of physicians and pharmacists, and hard drugs are those that are illicit, which shores up the authority of pharmacists as the only legitimate purveyors of medicines, and it further entrenches that drug-medicine divide. Now, in this last section, on these next slides, I want to delve into Frank Pinchek's posters. And I'm going to look at a few specifically that play on the themes that we've been talking about throughout this presentation. Frank Pinchek was a practicing pharmacist in Patterson, New Jersey. And in 1954, he started what he called the Professional Advancement Plan. And it was a program that produced these so-called ethical displays, as you can see all throughout this page. The aim of these were to replace the commercial displays that were very common in drugstores and pharmacies across the United States at that time that would often advertise drugs in a way that was increasingly being cracked down upon with federal regulation. He wanted to use these displays to replace commercial ones with ethical ones that would demonstrate the importance of pharmacy, the role of pharmacists, as well as educate the public on issues related to pharmacy and potential ways to grapple with them. There's a whole collection of these posters from the 50s and 60s that were donated to the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy in 2013. And each set includes three posters, a main one that you see in the middle and two side posters. But it really was a main goal of these to make clear to consumers of pharmaceuticals why they should trust their pharmacist, the training their pharmacist had, and also educate them on the benefits and harms of particular drugs. You can see these on the American Institute for the History of Pharma Pharmacy website. I highly recommend looking through them because there's some really interesting ones. and I'm only really looking at a sliver of them today. So 
On the next slide, I want to zoom into one of these specific ones, the pharmacy and accuracy slide or poster and the slide about it. The reason I want to look at this one is because it harkens back to that original political cartoon that we were talking about at the beginning of this presentation. Now, what it says right at the top here is that pharmacy and accuracy go hand in hand in compounding every prescription. And if you look back, that previous slide actually had three different poster sets that were all about the training and the abilities and capacities of your pharmacist to do these things accurately for them. Why I really want to point this out is because it returns us to the idea of correct dosing that was brought up by the political cartoon. So if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, I pulled that out again, just so you can be reminded. There is the pharmacist chained by their neck to the wall. And above their head is not only a bottle of dope, but something that they can use to measure it and dose it correctly, which was part of the problem implied in that political cartoon. What this means in the context of this poster is that the ability to be accurate in your dosing is what distinguishes the professionalism of the pharmacist versus someone who's just dosing it for themselves. What's implied in the political cartoon was that the accurate dosing of the pharmacist is what kept people who use drugs in a stable position in their lives, rather than one in which they were forced to seek out illicit drugs and spend more and more money on it. It was about harm reduction, to put it simply, although that wasn't the term that was used, and the safety of the patient that was available through the authority of the pharmacist in their accurate dosing. On the next slide, I want to point out how some of, these or some of these posters presented problems that were going on in pharmacy and potential solutions as well as causes of them. So the four images you see here all relate to specific issues in pharmacy. That top row has to do with narcotics addiction and on the other hand, mental illness, which is said to be American's number one health problem at this time, which seems to be a continuing problem to this day. And on the bottom row, you see Opium on the left hand, which could be said to be a cause of narcotics addiction. And on the right hand, tranquilizers, which is a potential solution for mental illness at that time. While these posters do not deal necessarily with the credibility, the training, the authority of pharmacists, they do deal with issues that the pharmacist is specifically prepared to deal with, showing here's what they're good at, here's why you should trust them, here's the type of questions that you could be asking a pharmacist. Furthermore, one of these posters in particular do make reference to the credibility and importance of pharmacists, and that's the poster of opium, which I wanna conclude with in this final slide up next. The reason why I wanna end here is that they make a particular appeal to the right hands for these drugs versus the wrong hands of these drugs. So on the small poster on the left-hand side, what you see is, your pharmacist is the legal custodian of all drugs and medicines in the United States, saying that this is where you can get legitimate drugs and medicines. This is who should be trusted and the people who have authority on that topic. But what's most important here and what I want to point out are these pull quotes. It says right at the top, opium. And then at the bottom of the middle poster, it says in the right hands, it's one of the greatest contributions to medicine. And in the wrong hand, it's the beginning of the end. The rationale could be their training, their ability to dose accurately, or many other reasons. But regardless of those reasons, the poster makes clear that drugs are only in the right hands when they're in the hands of your pharmacist, when they're considered soft drugs or medicines that have been prescribed and dosed by physicians and pharmacists. Otherwise, it could be the beginning of the end, according to this poster, which is common to the drug hysteria rhetoric of that time, but it really gets back to the idea of soft drugs versus hard drugs and who are the legitimate purveyors with the authority to prescribe them accurately. With that, I'll go ahead and end there. Thank you all for your time, for listening to me talk through these materials. Yeah, thanks so much, Gabe. Uh, and I'll just say, just as sort of, uh, a pump up the tires kind of moment. If you're interested in these uh, themes around professional identity, uh, pharmacist authority, 
uh, and the ways in which uh, pharmacies organize their spaces, including psychoactive substances. You can see uh, Gabe and, and I have uh, co-authored a paper which is forthcoming. Uh, the paper is gonna be available um, in the next several weeks or months. It's called Conscientious Guardian versus Commercialized Jungle, Pharmacists and Pharmacy Design in the post-war United States. And we're very excited to have shared uh, this, uh, this time with you and also look forward to sharing the paper with you. And with that, we are going to stop the share and turn um, it over to anyone here who wishes to ask questions uh, or make comments.